This is the CBS Evening News with Bob Schieffer. Good evening. There are now 83 known dead in the Las Vegas Hotel fire. Still, the search for more bodies continues, and as yet, no cause for the fire has been determined. Here's David Dow with our report. Outside, the MGM Grand is still an imposing landmark of the Las Vegas Strip. But inside, the hotel casino lies in total devastation. The flames rolled along like tidal waves, said one fire official. Authorities believe the fire started in one of the hotel's six restaurants. Just how, they aren't sure. But they do seem sure that the loss would have been much less had today's safety standards been in effect when the MGM Grand was built in the early 70s. Automatic sprinklers, for instance, they existed here only in the basement, in part of the casino, and on the 26th floor. We believe if this building would have been completely sprinkled, that the fire would have never got out of hand. It could happen in any hotel in any place in the country. Why is that? Just because of the uh, not having the sprinklers, not having smoke detectors, uh, the way buildings are constructed. As the hotel war, the battle to be bigger and grander, has escalated here, fire officials have worried about a high-rise fire. Like most fire departments, they say, they are ill-prepared to fight fires and rescue masses of people from upper floors. That's where most of the people died here. And an official of the MGM Grand says he isn't sure whether big buildings can be made completely safe. That I don't know. I don't think uh, uh, it is a question I can answer. Uh, we conform to all codes, and I th I'm sure that uh, no, there's no building in the United States that is built does not conform to the code of the day. In about 20 minutes, we're going to be ready to go into the building and pick up your possessions. Now, ladies, Today, hundreds who survived the fire and spent last night in other hotels lined up to return to their rooms for their belongings. They said things were still smoky, but generally all right. In the crowd were Roberto Villanueva, his hands burned and bandaged after sliding five floors on a rope to safety, and John Baudouin, who escaped through a smoky corridor and relived it when he returned today. It's a gut feeling you get and uh, you'll never lose it probably. You, know? and you look back and I can feel it right in the pit of the stomach again. And Wes and Della Tassin vacationing here after fire burned up their home three months ago. Well, I talked to Billy Graham yesterday. He said, thank the old man up there. Come out of two fire like this. Tonight, the investigation into how this fire got out of hand continues. David Dow, CBS News, Las Vegas. The unity tastes so fine. The unity pure and natural wine. The unity on ice. The unity so nice. The unity, ooh. The unity on ice. Red, white, and rose. What a nice way to break the ice. Chattanooga Choo Choo with Chug Chug by Tyco. There was a new development today in the American hostage situation. Iran's official news agency says that Iran has complained that the initial U.S. response to the hostage release conditions is murky and evasive. And it says Iran, through Algerian intermediaries, has asked for an explicit yes or no answer from the United States. In Washington, the State Department said it would have no comment until it receives Iran's message. Department headquarters, there was another briefing today for hostage family members who've been waiting in vain now for 55 weeks. Barry Peterson has that story. As Dorothea Morphy left San Diego, she carried with her some complaints about the State Department, saying she and the other families, especially those who live far from Washington, are not getting enough attention. The further away we get, it seems like the less satisfied we are with the information we're getting. This is a problem, of course. It gets relayed second or third hand when, when we do get information, and it's, it's really not adequate. Today at the State Department, she joined seven other board members of the hostage family organization FLAG for an hour-long briefing by Deputy Secretary of State Warren Christopher. 
described as a discussion of the process of the negotiations without revealing their content. She emerged grateful for the information, but not entirely satisfied. They're still there, the, the, some of the problems. Uh, certainly, I am, I am delighted about the briefing that we were given. Uh, whether or not it's a unique thing remains to be seen. The problem is that there is not new news every day, and so without news, there's very little to call about. It's terribly difficult, there's no question about it, when you're not living in the Washington area, when you're feeling um, isolated, or uh, although you probably have a radio or a television set, it simply isn't the same thing. We know that. Mrs. Moorfield and other family members acknowledge that some of their dissatisfaction with the department is a result of the frustration of waiting, waiting that, for the moment, still has no end in sight. Barry Peterson, CBS News, the State Department. The Mideast War has apparently triggered a major split in the Arab world. Syria said today it will boycott next week's Arab League summit in Amman and indicated four other hardline Arab states and the PLO will follow suit. Syria supports Iran in the war and wanted the summit postponed to promote an image of Arab unity. They're not in here. Honey! Come on, let's go. Hey, whoa, what's happened? We lost all our traveler's checks. Oh, that's too bad. What kind were they? Uh, American Express. American Express? Relax. Let's call them. Great. You can call for help anytime from anywhere in the country with American Express traveler's checks. Ask for them by name. It's not burning, Harold. Some fire logs start slow and others burn out fast. It's out, Harold. But Duraflame starts fast. It's already burning, Harold. And burns for a long time. It's still burning, Harold. Duraflame, with its easy light strip, starts faster, burns longer than any other fire log. It's still burning, Harold. Harold. Duraflame, the fastest way to the longest fire. John McCormick of Massachusetts died this afternoon. McCormick spent 42 years in the House of Representatives. He was the first Roman Catholic to be elected its speaker. He was 88 years old. A nephew who was at the bedside said he had been in failing health for some months. President-elect Ronald Reagan back on the West Coast after a week in Washington, and today he met in Los Angeles with some of his key people to begin sorting out who should take what job in the new administration. Jerry Bowen has a report on that. The people charged with the talent hunt for the president-elect's cabinet gathered in downtown Los Angeles this morning for what was billed as their final meeting. An indication decisions might be close, though senior advisors said none would be made today. Reagan was scheduled to participate only an hour, but stayed two and a half hours, reviewing resumes and biographies of potential appointments, he later said, still hoping to announce those appointments at the end of this month or the first week in December. As he left, Reagan was asked what kind of progress was made today. Well, it was a working meeting, and I think that's the best to say. There is still nothing to announce because there have been no decisions made on as to... Uh, uh, final decisions made, but it was, it's a long, laborious process of combing a lot of names. In response to questions, Reagan said the list had not been pared down to a final three candidates for each post as he had hoped, and he said some new names emerged. Some new, some, uh, some I was aware of before that had been introduced, but it is a constantly moving thing. Ushering Reagan to his limousine was his personal attorney, William French Smith, director of the talent hunt and himself, a candidate for attorney general, though Reagan declined comment on that prospect. No cabinet positions are expected to be announced until after Thanksgiving, though some decisions may be made before then, at a meeting that Reagan has scheduled for Monday with his senior advisors and the vice president-elect. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Los Angeles. For centuries, women have impatiently waited for the men they loved to return from the sea. At Christmas time, there's no better way to express that love than a gift of Old Spice. Old Spice. Fresh. Clean. Masculine. Sensual. A wonderful gift for a man. A wonderful way to please a woman. This Christmas, give Old Spice to someone you love. On mornings like these, I can't let minor arthritis pain or its stiffness 
stop me. So I turn to the warming power of Ben Gay. Ben Gay warming power works fast. I rub in Ben Gay and feel that good old warming power deep, right where it hurts, breaking up pain and its stiffness for hours of relief. No wonder Ben Gay's America's number one selling arthritis rub. It's got warming power. When arthritis pain grips you, break the grip of pain with Ben Gay. Two years ago this week, the mass murder-suicide at Jonestown in Guyana shocked the world. One of its central figures is back in the United States today to face charges of conspiracy in the incident that set the tragedy in motion, the murder of Congressman Leo Ryan. Steve Young reports. After spending the last two years in jail in steamy Guyana, Larry Layton returned to the United States last night coatless, surrounded by federal marshals at Kennedy Airport in New York. Mr. Layton, did you shoot Congressman Ryan? Layton was tried and cleared by a Guyanese court of charges involving the wounding of two people in an ambush at a dusty airstrip in Port Kaituma, several miles from the People's Temple Jungle Settlement. In this country, a federal grand jury in San Francisco last month handed up a four-count indictment. Of those accused, he is the sole survivor. The indictment charges Layton and other People's Temple members now dead of conspiring to kill Congressman Leo Ryan, conspiring to kill the Deputy Chief of Mission for the United States in Guyana, returning to Jonestown to conduct and supervise the executions and suicides of members of the People's Temple. Layton's attorney in New York was William Kunstler, who represented many political radicals in the 1960s. The brief 14-minute appearance today was not an arraignment, but a removal proceeding permitting authorities to transfer Layton to California. He stood quietly, his arms folded behind his back, then signed the necessary document, exchanged a few words with Kunstler, but otherwise said nothing. The marshals who brought Layton back from Guyana were in the car with him for the flight to the West Coast. Layton's lawyer reserved the right to challenge the constitutionality of the indictment and the process through which Layton was brought back to the United States. He is expected to be arraigned in San Francisco Monday. Steve Young, CBS News, at Federal Court in Brooklyn. An awesome sight today on a Florida beach where more than a dozen giant whales were stuck on the shore and a desperate effort was underway to save at least some of them. That report from Pam Olson. About 15 sperm whales, the largest number in Florida's recent history, beached themselves in shallow waters near St. Augustine. The whales ranged in size from 15 feet to 40 feet long. One weighed approximately six tons. Fishermen and volunteers who wanted to help stood by helplessly. Others tried to herd some of the mammals the back into deeper water. Got a shovel or anything like that? Anybody got a shovel in their boat? Volunteers were able to herd at least four whales back into the ocean, but for others, the efforts were futile. At least 11 died, some of them with calves still struggling for life at their sides. In the past, investigators have not been able to explain the animal's behavior, but in an effort to solve the mystery, autopsies will be conducted on the animals. Every time there were whale strands, we learned something. One of these days we're going to be able to come on a scene like this instead of going away and feeling bad. We're going to be able to do something, and this is the most important thing. Many of the whales were wounded when they landed on sharp oyster beds. Hurting those animals back into the water would have only made them easy targets for the sharks. Pam Olson, CBS News, Jacksonville. Mae West died today in Hollywood. She had suffered a stroke several months ago. No one knows for sure how old she was because she was old-fashioned about that. She just wouldn't tell. She was not so old-fashioned about some other things, and that made for a remarkable show business career. Reviewed now by Terry Drinkwater. Uh, you were wonderful tonight. I'm always wonderful at night. <laughs> Yes, but tonight you were especially good. Well, when I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. <laughs> One-liners from Mae West. Today, they may seem only vaguely vulgar or comically camp. But you have to remember, back then, this lady was a shocker. I am a good boy. I am a good man. I am a good girl. What is this, propaganda? Ah, Lady Lou, you're a fine gal, a fine woman, one of the finest women ever walked the streets. A menace to morals, said ministers. Baffle box office, said Broadway and Hollywood producers. Goodness. 
a beautiful diamond. Goodness had nothing to do with it, dearie. She grew up in Brooklyn, started in showbiz at age seven, dancing at the Elks Club, and discovered as she moved on to vaudeville and then to the movies that even in those tame times, nothing sold like sex. I should come up sometime, huh? Well, I... Don't be afraid, I won't tell. But, uh... Come up, I'll tell your fortune. Looking back, she remarked that she never cussed, never took her clothes off. It wasn't what I said, she said, but how I said it. Well, it's not the men in your life that counts, it's the life in your men. <laughs> she may have been Hollywood's first liberated woman, and she carried on that way right up to the end. How do you spend your time these days? Busy, busy, busy. <laughs> you must come up and see me sometime. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, my little chickadee. May West was, perhaps, 87. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Hollywood. A daredevil stunt ended in death today in St. Louis. Kenneth Sires had skydived from a plane and opened his parachute and accomplished what had seemed an almost unbelievable goal. He landed on the top of St. Louis's mammoth 630 feet tall arch. But just moments later, he was caught by a gust of wind, blown off the arch. The spare parachute did not open. He fell to his death. This is the world's first Space Age word game. Scrabble brand sensor, electronic word game. You punch your hidden word into the computer and then watch while your opponent tries to pry it out. Sensor gives hints, but not the answer. But when the word is out, everyone knows it. Sensor, playing with words the Space Age way from the people who make Scrabble brand crossword game. Cell Show and Writer, another name for fun and games. I see you're buying a long-lasting nasal spray. Why? It gives me long-lasting relief. How long? Well, it says 8 to 10 hours. Here's duration nasal spray. How long does it give relief? It says up to 12 hours. That's some difference. That's 2 to 4 hours longer. That's because duration has the longest-lasting nasal decongestant. Now, which one are you going to use? Why, this one. Duration. Duration with up to 2 to 4 hours more relief. The proof's on the package. So now we know who shot him, and to be sure, a lot of us know. They say the audience for Dallas last night may be the largest ever to watch a TV show, and they're still talking about it today, from JR's hometown to London, where the show won't be seen until tonight. Our intercontinental follow-up begins with a report prepared by John Blackstone in The London. videotape of the episode arrived for the BBC under the care of a special courier from Los Angeles. London policemen were there for protection. But while the videotape may have been safe, the secret wasn't. It didn't take long for the revelation to jump across the Atlantic. You don't want to hear this momentous announcement before you see it on telly. You'd better close your ears, turn down the sound, or make loud noises, because here it comes. The person who shot J.R. is Kristen. Independent Radio News, it's three minutes past. On the streets of London today, the question about the shooting of J.R. was not who was holding the gun, but who would jump the gun. In a front-page story, the Daily Express said it could tell who fired the shot, but it wouldn't. The newspaper said it didn't want to spoil the show for anybody. A TV critic in the Daily Telegraph complained that stories about fictional characters have no place in news broadcasts. And there were those who found the premature revelation a bit unfair. I'll still watch it, but I think that if people have been watching, it's like a football program. If you know the score of a game beforehand, you won't bother to watch the game on a match of the day. Others insisted on keeping up the suspense. They refused to believe. Do you want me to tell you who? Yes. Christian. Yeah, that's right. Yes. But you, you don't believe that? Not really, no. <laughs> I don't think it's his mother. Some insisted they knew it all along. Well, because I knew it was her anyway, but um, I have ruined <laughs> I did. The people who run the William Hill betting shop say they won't believe it until they see it. They'll pay out almost $350,000 to those who bet on Kristen at 4 to 1. J.R. himself was in London this week for a royal variety performance and a visit with himself at Madame Tussauds. Well, in Britain, he refused to tell the secret, even to a very distinguished Dallas fan. Okay, even the Queen Mother. But you're not giving any hints just yet. Oh, you got to wait till, what is it, Saturday? Yeah. <laughs> Royalty, too, has been waiting to learn the answer. Among the 18 million Britons expected to be in front of their TVs tonight for Dallas, maybe some who live in very big houses.
John Blackstone, CBS News, London. The culprit is Kristen Shepard, J.R.'s sister-in-law, with whom he once had an affair but later threw over. It was fiction which had so captured the imagination of millions that the moment it was revealed, it was instant news. The episode of the television series Dallas Ballyhooed for months had finally come down to that most electric of moments, the answer to the riddle, who shot J.R.? Who's there? You went to the office that night with J.R.'s gun. It was you, Kristen, who shot J.R. On the way to the cast party in Beverly Hills, J.R. in real life, Larry Hagman, son of Mary Martin. Kristen did it. She did it with that little rascal. Larry. Kristen, the culprit, played by Mary Crosby, daughter of Bing Crosby, had been, as they say, written out of the script. Well, it's kind of nice to leave a series with a bang, so to speak. J.R.'s wife, long-suffering Sue Ellen, played by Linda Gray, will be back. Who knows, J.R. may have to be pumped full of lead again. A.C. Nielsen Company computers tallied the overnight audience figures. Based on these early returns, a CBS spokesman estimated 82 million people watched J.R. last night, probably a record. At Ohio State, college students had a party featuring J.R. look-alikes and act-alikes. In Chicago, Dallas was a hit in the public bars. And oh yes, in Dallas, a Who Shot JR party. About 100 showed up, well shod, some well armed, but all hanging on every word, every minute, coming from six television sets. Even the kitchen help had to know who shot JR. At last, it was over. Do I like him? I detest him. But I wouldn't miss it for the world. I think there's a lot of JR everywhere, a lot of JR here. I think he's the rat we always thought he was. <laughs> David Dick, CBS News, Dallas. What happened in Dallas was just fiction, of course, but what has suddenly unfolded in Houston is a bizarre new twist on a story that is very real. A true-life episode of murder, money, and intrigue that first hit the headlines almost a decade ago. Jim McManus is in Houston and has our report. Joan Robinson Hill, champion horsewoman, was first the princess, then the queen of Houston's high society. She lived among the mansions of the super-rich in River Oaks, the wife of the surgeon, Dr. John Hill, mother of young Robert, and perhaps most of all, the daughter of millionaire oil man, Ash Robinson. She died with shocking suddenness in 1969, and her death itself became only the first chapter in a family tragedy. Author Thomas Thompson called it a case of blood and money. Ash Robinson, a powerful and grief-stricken father, demanded to know how his only daughter died. Gossip and speculation struck at Dr. John Hill, rupturing social and professional ties in Houston's medical community. A grand jury indicted the surgeon for murder, and there was a mistrial. Then one night in 1972, Dr. Hill was shot to death by a waiting intruder inside his home on Kirby Drive in River Oaks. Small-time burglar Bobby Vandiver told police he did it for money. Before he came to trial, Bobby died in a shootout with police. But the state of Texas convicted one-time Madam Lila Paulus for making the payoff to Bobby. Convicted also prostitute Marcia McKittrick, who told the jury she helped Lila and Bobby and that Lila knew Ash Robinson. Three years ago, the third Mrs. John Hill, Connie, filed a civil suit for more than $7 million dollars attempting to link Ash Robinson with the death of her husband. The jury said Ash Robinson was not guilty. I don't believe that the jury cheated us, no. I believe that they, they did the best they could, but I do believe that they made the wrong decision. All that and much more developed after Joan Robinson Hill died, leaving doctors puzzled. Her symptoms, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, low blood pressure, kidney failure, severe shock death in no more than four days. Now, 11 years later, Dr. John Hill's defense lawyer, Richard Racehorse Haynes, believes he has found a terrible irony. I am not a, a doctor, but I am satisfied in my own mind that Joan Robinson Hill met her death, untimely as it was, as a consequence of what we now know to be toxic shock, that she did not meet her death as a consequence of any act or omission 
by John Robert Hill or anybody else. Dr. Joseph Yehimchek, Houston's medical examiner, reviewed the autopsy records. He agrees that Joan Robinson Hill had some of the classic symptoms of toxic shock syndrome. Some, he argues, she did not have. And so he's sticking with the 11-year-old finding, death by fulminating infection, the specific origin of which could not be determined. Dr. Paul Radelat, a Houston forensic pathologist, was among those who helped perform the most extensive autopsy on the body of Joan Hill. In light of present knowledge, he says many of her symptoms and post-mortem findings parallel toxic shock syndrome. It's a big leap in this case, but I think certainly it's at least highly possible, which is perhaps a next door neighbor to probable, you see? I think it's something we will never be able to be categorical about. But I don't think it's entirely fanciful either. Let me say that there are findings in the autopsy which indicate that Joan Hill was at the menstrual portion of her menstrual cycle or had just ceased to menstruate. Three deaths, two women in prison, a family destroyed. More than 11 years of headlines, lawsuits, a second book, and now a movie in the making. In Houston, they say this story will never die. Dottie Oates, a close friend of Joan Hill's, recalls that Joan regularly used tampons and wonders now if it was toxic shock syndrome. Well, it's food for thought. As a professional nurse, Giving that consideration that I didn't have back then, it uh, makes a great deal of sense that it could have been. Since they were never able to pinpoint, you know, any particular gravity of an illness. And attorney Richard Haynes wonders if a different medical verdict might have prevented a series of tragedies. I think everybody who knew them ought to know about it. Everybody who's read about them, who's made judgments as a consequence of reading a million seller book by Tommy Thompson ought to have access to that information so that the judgment they each made when they read through that book would uh, have a chance to be at least more fair to the memory of John Hill. Joe McManus, CBS News, Houston. That's the news. I'm Bob Schieffer, CBS News, New York. Good night. Hello. I was a dedicated blade shaver till my wife bought me this Remington Microscreen Shaver because it would shave as close as a blade or your money back. The first microscreen is so thin it shaves incredibly close, the second even closer. And Remington's American made. It costs less. Norelco's imported. It costs much more. I was so impressed, I bought the company. The Remington Microscreen shaves as close as a blade or I'll give you your money back. And the Lady Remington, the perfect gift, also with a money back guarantee. General Motors introduces Computer Command Control, a new system that uses this onboard computer to help achieve the highest corporate average fuel economy in GM history, while reducing exhaust emissions to the lowest in GM history. From now on, you will activate this computer when you step on the gas. Computer Command Control on all standard and most optional gasoline engines from Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. This has been the CBS Evening News with Bob Schieffer. Tomorrow's guest on Face the Nation will be Edward Siega, Prime Minister of Jamaica. For an update on Sunday's events, watch the CBS Sunday Night News. Darwin versus the Bible. I'm Charles Kiralt. The great evolution debate has started all over again. The story tomorrow on Sunday morning. This is CBS. When you buy, rent, or lease an Olter Datsun from Herb Gordon's Auto World on Route 29, you get something extra special. Team service. A group of qualified mechanics are assigned to your car and work together as a team to get the job done right and save you time and money. Now, son, these old boys may not be much to look at, but they do mighty pretty work. Who's not much to look at? Certainly not you, sir. Herb Gordon, one of the wonders of the world. After the parades, after the promises, someone's got to work.